Hi, everyone. It's Russ, and welcome to another episode of Women's Retirement Radio. Today, I am excited to be joined by a friend of many years, um, also someone who spent four decades in the financial advice industry in one role or another. Um, so, uh, Mark Chuchi, welcome to the uh, podcast. Glad to be here, Russ. Yeah, I'm, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad you could join us. I'm excited for our conversation and happy we can share it with our listeners. Why don't we start by you just telling us a little bit about who you are and what it is you do or what you've done maybe uh, over, over your 40 years or so in this industry? Um, well, 40 years covers a lot of ground. I've done everything from uh, meet with clients personally, build an advisory business, sell that business, start another company that really was designed to train advisors to deliver a better client experience. So that company um, ended up semi-retiring at the beginning of this year, and now I'm just doing some consulting on projects of interest. So uh, it's it's been a fairly uh, varied journey, to be sure. Yeah, and I, I, I was thinking before we got on to talk this morning, I was thinking like when you and I first met, and I've got to think it was probably 12 or maybe 15 years ago. I think it was back at a meeting in Las Vegas, as I recall. It was indeed. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, you and I have got uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of history uh, in addition to your work um, doing a lot of different uh, and interesting things in, in this industry. What I'm curious about is, Having been an advisor, having built, run, and ultimately sold a business, then having moved into more of a uh, training, um, coaching role for other advisors, and, and continue to do that a little bit today through your consulting work, um, how would you say that your perspective on the business of financial advice has evolved or changed over those 40 or so years? I think there's a segment of our industry. Um, well represented by your firm, by the way, uh, that have really figured out the right way to help clients make quality financial decisions and, and advance their financial life in a manner that's consistent with their goals and values. Um, unfortunately, I don't believe that that's a, a statement you can apply across the industry in quite the way I would have liked to believe would happen considering you know how long I've been doing this. Um, there's still people making a living selling commissionable products. you know if you'd have told me in 1985 that that would be the case 40 years later, I, I would have told you that you were crazy, but yet here we are. Yeah. And having your perspective, um, having been you know at this for a number of years, um, having seen what's changed um, and, and maybe more importantly, what hasn't changed um, from your perspective as both a former advisor and now working with advisors and other firms, what would you say is the biggest challenge that a financial advisor, and I'm speaking generally, but a, a financial advisor, what's the biggest challenge they have the opportunity to help people address or solve? Ask that again a little differently. I, I want to be sure I answer the question you're asking. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess what I'm wanting to know is um, speaking either from your perspective personally or from the perspective of an advisor that maybe you've, you've worked with or are working with. Um, you know, I think a lot of consumers have uh, different perspectives or different ideas of what it is they think an advisor does or what it is they think their advisor does. And so I'm curious to know what you think the biggest challenge or the biggest opportunity, maybe is a better word, um, that advisors um, have to help uh, people address. So, if so, if if you're thinking of me as an example, and I'm working with a, a woman that's preparing for retirement, um, what do you think is the uh, biggest challenge that a, a woman preparing for retirement or a similar, you know, say pre-retiree? Uh, type person uh, might be facing that an advisor like myself or another advisor that you've worked with uh, doing it right, by the way, uh, can help them solve, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's just a big question. Um, we're, here to uh, answer the, we're here to answer the big ones, Mark. Yeah, right, fair enough. Fair enough, Russ. Um, I, I think starting from the advisor and then working to the client, 
I think the, the biggest challenge for the advisor is, is getting out of their own way. And what I mean by that is advisors who have come into this business have come into this business primarily because they were good at gathering assets, right? That is the business that we are in is, is gathering and managing assets. That's how our industry compensates itself is by gathering and managing assets. And yet uh, an advisor's ability to gather and manage assets is not in any way correlated with a client's successful journey to their individual financial goals. The, the advisor's ability to counsel a client wisely to pursue their individual values and goals is completely disconnected from the business of managing money. And I think that that disconnect is the biggest challenge. And I think the most difficult thing for somebody contemplating working with an advisor, particularly in the context of, you know, a decision as important as, is this the right time or can I afford to retire, is simply identifying an advisor who's moved past um, the asset gathering model and is delivering some form of meaningful advice. So a, a fairly sprawling answer to a very large question. Yeah, well, that's that's helpful. And I think that helps set the stage for some other things that I I think it'd be interesting for, for us to discuss. Maybe it might be helpful if if to put a little bit more context up around this idea of maybe transcending the asset gathering kind of uh, mode of thinking and to more of a holistic client-centered advice model. Could you maybe give an example or maybe a, a story of um, either, uh, you know, either winding back to when you worked as an advisor, maybe working with a client, or maybe more recently, uh, maybe an advisor or firm that you worked with that you kind of helped guide through that process, that evolution, that shift, and maybe some of the positive outcomes that were experienced as a result. Well, let me just start with, with an anecdote that I think helps highlight the problem we're trying to solve on this call, right? Uh, I was talking to the CEO of the largest financial planning software firm in the country. And we were talking a little bit about this issue of, you know, is the software truly being used to develop financial plans? Financial plan is a context or a, a a metaphor for a meaningful wealth strategy over a client's financial lifetime, right? Is it really being used for that? And, and he said, no, it's not. And I said, well, well, how do you know? And he said, well, we have 2 million plans on our platform, 2 million plans. That's 2 million households. And he asked me, so what do you think the average number of individual goals are on that financial plan? And I thought, well, gosh, you know, retirement, education, legacy, travel, health and wellness, uh, you know, I don't know. I said five to seven. And he said, nope. He said 1.1. 1. 1. Wow. And what that really highlighted to me was, yes, in fact, they are using financial planning software to gather assets, not to create a meaningful financial plan. And I don't even mean financial plan in, in the tactical sense of, you know, are your estate documents current and, and, and all of that. I, I mean, at the most fundamental level of, hey, can, is this client going to be OK? You know, can they live their life with a reasonable degree of confidence, given all of life's uncertainties, that, that they're on the proper path? And, you know, the industry doesn't do a very good job of that. As a matter of fact, my, my former CEO was very smart when he said, our industry is very, very good at helping people to die rich. And what he meant by that was we are very, very good and, and out of an abundance of caution at telling people to save more, spend less, work longer, stay fully invested, right? in an effort to make sure that we minimize life's uncertainties. Well, that's all fine if your goal is to die rich, but for most people, it isn't. 
Matter of fact, only 15% of the clients that I worked with ever had a specific dollar amount that they wanted to leave to their heirs. The most common legacy goal for my clients was whatever's left. They just wanted to live their lives as richly as possible. And so I think one of the biggest disconnects in the industry is the notion of minimizing the chance of failure with the concept of helping people with a life well lived. I appreciate you sharing that. There's, there's, a, there's a lot we could unpack there. Um, and let me preface this next question by saying, I think you and I largely see uh, or, or think of planning done the right way uh, in a similar fashion. Um, but having said that, um, and since you kind of mentioned it based on that conversation you had with the CEO of the planning software firm um, and the apparent evidence of uh, or lack of evidence of, you know, real financial planning taking place for the majority of their 2 million clients uh, or in, in clients or customers. Could you speak at least at a high level? Like, what do you think from your perspective, Mark, how, do, how, do, how does a client with the help of an advisor, let's say, go about actually building or creating or experiencing uh, a, a well-delivered financial planning process? Well, let's get definitional for just a second because it's important, right? There's, there's the big picture plan, right? Which, which to me is the, am I gonna be okay? And how do I, with some reasonable amount of confidence, plan for life surprises, right? That, that's sort of the big picture. When people think about being on track for retirement, for example, that, those are the things they need to consider. So let's talk about planning as a strategy versus tactical financial planning, right? So doing a comprehensive financial plan that meets the definition, say, of the Board of Standards and Practices for Certified Financial Planners, who would look at budgeting, debt management, income taxes, estate planning, you know, things like beneficiary designations, life insurance, you know, a, a, a much more comprehensive view. And, and those are two very different things. Um, you know, somebody who's five years into retirement uh, is not going to see their financial planning needs change all that much. They still have to make sure they're okay and they still have to account for life surprises, uh, but they're not going to be, you know, they may not, not even have any life insurance anymore, right? Versus somebody who's starting a family and has, you know, education goals and, and you know, a whole bunch of things that are very, very granular that they need to account for. So, you know, when you talk about a financial plan, you have to be very clear about you know, what you're talking about, because one can very easily be confused with the other. Got it. Got it. So with those definitions or concepts in place, um, from, from your perspective, if, if, we're, if we're talking about more of the, am I going to be okay plan? Am I going to have enough with a reasonable level of confidence um, to deal with life's uncertainties and surprises along the way? Um, I think you've already kind of indirectly spoken to the fact that um, while a lot of advisors and a lot of firms give lip service to that idea, um, maybe they're not actually delivering it um, in, in, in the sense that it could or should be delivered. So using that as kind of the, the foundation, as you, as you kind of laid it out, what would you say is the best way uh, for an advisor-client relationship to, to work on work on that project together? Um, well, you're, you and I are going to be in violent agreement on this, um, but it first starts with a, a conceptual understanding of the problem we're trying to solve, right? Yep. So as much as we would love to have certainty in our life, the fact is that life and the markets are fundamentally uncertain. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to understand and, and embrace that uncertainty and that we're going to build this plan to deal with, with life surprises, right? So we have some goal in mind. Let's make it simple. I want to be able to retire at a certain age. And at that age, I want to be able to enjoy a certain lifestyle with a 
quote unquote, reasonable probability of success? Well, first of all, what is reasonable? Well, you don't want to live your life in, you know, the fear of running out of money, right? So, so we don't want to be so close to the, the, the guardrail or the, the line of uncertainty that, that there's too high of a probability that our plan won't be successful. On the other hand, there's nothing virtuous about 100% probability of success either. And, and I'm speaking here in terms of um, something like a Monte Carlo simulation or something that's going to determine your, your probability of success with something other than a fixed rate of return, every year, right? which, we, which we know as zero chance of ever happening. So 100% probability is, is not desirable either because that means you're going to die in a mattress stuff full of money you could have spent. And for people who don't have a legacy goal, that would be a plan designed specifically to produce a huge legacy. So you don't want a plan that's designed to produce an outcome that you don't value. So with those two sort of guardrails in place, right, we want to live our life, don't want to have the risk of running out, don't want to run the risk of leaving too much behind. Right? So that's the first concept we have to agree on. And within that concept, then we can look at your assets, we can look at your goals, we can run that stress test, right? And, and we can determine out of a thousand potential simulated financial lifetimes, what percentage of those are successful. And that's going to be somewhere near between zero and 100. Then let's say we agree that below 75, too much risk of running out, right? So we don't want to be below 75. Uh, above 90, too much risk of dying rich, right? In other words, sacrificing lifestyle we could be enjoying for a future we might not live to see. So we're going to agree that between 75 and 90 is where we want to live. And let's say we're fortunate enough to land right smack in the middle. We're at 83%. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean we have a 17% our chance our plan will fail? No. No plan ever fails because you'll adjust something in that plan so that you don't run out of money. So really what that 17% is, is more of a probability of adjustment. In other words, given the uncertainty, let's say simply in the market, what are the chances in the next one year, three years, five years, that based on stock volatility, I'm going to need to make a change to my plan? Well, in this particular person's case, that's a 17% chance. And we can even tell them with a little bit of trial and error how big of an adjustment they might need to make if the market were to, say, decline 10%, 20%, 30%, whatever they want to look at. In other words, we can't give them certainty, but we can most certainly give them a high degree of clarity around what that you know, range of potential futures might look like and some certainty about their ability to make the adjustments that might need to be made. So is my plan likely to succeed? Yes. Is that probability sufficient that I don't have a risk of running out or that I'm not at risk of leaving too much behind? Yes. All right. Well, when things happen, what sort of change will I need to make? And is that a change that I'm willing to accommodate such that I can say, yes, in fact, I am okay. I'm going to submit my retirement paperwork tomorrow and I'm going to sail off into the sunset. Yeah, that's, um, there's a lot there that we could dive into. Uh, maybe we'll touch on a few things, but uh, hey, first of all, thanks for sharing that. Um, I think I think you uh, talk about a big question. I think you tackled a, a pretty uh, a pretty big, broad, meaty topic in a very concise and digestible format, which is super helpful for both myself and our, our listeners. So thank you. Well, um, remember too that that you know for the last fifteen years I've been speaking to advisors, not to their clients. Right. And so a, a fair bit of that may sound like advisor speak. Um, and, and that would be because it is. Um, 
And, and so I, I guess anybody listening to this, you know, take take it with 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 that in mind. Well, I appreciate that qualifier, but while listening to you, I, I thought I thought it was very accessible from a a non advisor. Um, it, it, I mean, um, regardless, but yeah, to to your point, I I. I, I appreciate you explaining that context, but I, I think that was that was helpful regardless of who's listening. Um, That's good to hear. One kind of follow-up question, and, and I think this goes back to something we talked about earlier when you talked to the CEO of the financial planning software, and he said there's of our 2 million plans, the average number of goals is 1.1, which which in my mind, and, and maybe this is a little oversimplified, but in my mind, that that seems to tell me that that many of those plans were being more used more as a proposal than mm -hmm. the actual start of an ongoing planning process or an ongoing planning relationship. Um, and when you were just describing using Monte Carlo and this idea of stress testing a plan to account for future uncertainty and future markets and, 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 and having enough confidence, but not too much, um, that's all well and good uh, based on what we know today, but clearly uh, life changes, markets change, um, Tax legislation changes. Uh, the political climate is uh, anybody's guess. So, could you speak just a moment, Mark, about the the value of planning on an ongoing basis? Kind of planning the verb versus a plan uh, as a noun, if you will. Yeah, I, I think that's really the key to all of this, right? Because we know life's going to change, and we can, as you just did catalog a whole list of what those changes might be. Some of them are fairly certain, right? The markets are going to go up and down. That's certain. Uh, our life is not infinite. That's certain. Um, something's going to change in the tax law here, fairly likely, somewhat less certain, but, but still highly likely, right? So, so, you know, we can look at what we know about uncertainty and simply make the judgment, since we don't know what and when those uncertainties will manifest themselves in and on our lives, then it might make some sense to touch base every six months or, or at whatever frequency you decide is appropriate based on the unique circumstance um, and check in, right? This is where we were supposed to be, right? Here's where we actually are for whatever reason. Uh, we're ahead of where we thought we'd be. Okay, great. That means we have some great choices. Maybe we do something like take a trip we didn't think we could afford or go somewhere with our grandkids. Or maybe it's something as simple as, hey, I, I don't have to take as much risk anymore. Maybe I shouldn't. Or if it goes the other way, uh, and we're now in a situation where there's some uncertainty, right? what's the right way to get back on track and, and to do that based on what I, the client, uniquely value. Because one person might choose to change the allocation in their portfolio, maybe take more risk. Another person might say, you know, I'm taking about as much risk as I care to. I'll just work an extra year. Or another person might say, you know what, I'm willing to settle for a little bit less uh, and, and retire with 90% of the income instead of 100 you know, and, and that's where an advisor can be uniquely helpful because you can do those sorts of what if scenarios very, very easily without regard to what planning software you use, provided that you have a shared vision of, again, where that client or what that client wants their financial life to look like and the means to update that plan on a regular basis. Yeah, I, I just I, I've 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 said um, in conversations and have actually written about this many times, as as some of my listeners will recognize. But I I'm really glad you kind of highlighted that that idea about the ongoing check ins and basically reevaluating things, accommodating new information as as we experience it, um, and as you as you highlighted some of the some of the changes and um, uh, dynamics of our lives, both financially and otherwise, we'll likely see coming. Many we won't. And so uh, I think that just underscores the the opportunity and, and ultimately the benefit of, of regularly 
sitting down, reviewing things and saying, are, are we still on track? Do we still have enough confidence, but not too much? And based on, you know, where that, where that falls based on where the, you know, the, the, based on what the data looks like at that point in time, you want to reevaluate your choices and the trade-offs among them to, you know, basically recalibrate and keep your plan on track. And I think that's, I think that's where the real crux of the, the planning benefit, you know, rest for clients. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, if you're going to drive cross country, um, you know, you, you map out your route first, right. You've got to know not just where you want to go, but the best path to get there. Right. If I want to drive from LA to New York city, do I want to take the Northern route uh, through the Rockies? Do I want to take the Southern route, maybe see the grand Canyon or do I want to take 80 and just shoot right straight across the middle? Right. So that's your broad stroke plan, right? Here's where I am. Here's where I want to go. Here's the route I want to take to get there, right? How long I want to work, what sort of lifestyle I want to have. And of course, as you're making your journey cross country, things will come up, right? Maybe uh, the dog ran away. You didn't leave on time. Maybe you were in a big traffic jam. Maybe you ran into road construction. Maybe there was an accident or maybe none of those things happened. And you were so far ahead of the game, you know, you decide, you know, hey, maybe we can take that drive up Pikes Peak or go see the world's largest rubber band ball, you know, that, that we didn't think we were going to have time for. So you use your GPS as you're making that cross country drive to determine whether you're ahead, behind or right on schedule. And a financial plan in the broad sense, um, in the strategic sense, does the same thing for your financial life. And if you don't check it and see whether you're ahead or behind, you're going to end up getting clipped. Yeah, I, I promised to our listeners this was not planned or set up, but um, I had written um, just a week or two ago in my weekly email newsletter about the, this idea of not not thinking in terms of goals, but in terms of directions and kind of tying it to this road trip or travel metaphor, which, which I think Mark just explained more elo uh, elegantly than, than I have ever attempted to. Um, I, and I think that just, uh, I think does a really nice job of painting the picture of um, not just kind of the process, but um, the fact that, you know, this isn't set it and forget it. This is not, you know, Tesla autopilot where you just, you know, point your car the right direction and you know you'll be there in a few hours or a few days depending on the distance i think um, i think it really brings to the forefront this idea of the advisor shares a lot of responsibility to regularly review and update the plan but also the client bears some responsibility to be engaged as well and have a voice in you know where they're going and the adjustments they want to make to their plan to keep it on track along the way as well so i, I think that's a, a brilliant analogy and i I'm glad you I'm glad you shared it. Um, I think that's a really helpful way to explain it to to folks that are listening. So thank you for that, um, Mark. Before we kind of shift more to this idea of retirement um, and retirement for women specifically, um, we've covered a lot. I think you and I could easily talk another couple of hours without you know breaking stride. Is there is there anything that I didn't ask you that? you wished that I had asked you, or is there anything else you want to cover before we kind of move on to the, the, the next segment? No, I, I think we covered it pretty effectively from a big picture standpoint. I think you know, hopefully people listening will get a sense as to what maybe is the right way to work with an advisor or is an advisor I'm considering working with sharing these same themes uh, or uh, are they more interested in, and in, you said it, uh, I was trying to, you know, be a little bit less blunt, but you, you hit it right in the head, uh, using a financial plan or the promise of a, of a financial plan simply as a means to produce an investment portfolio uh, and tell somebody that if you invest your money with me, you'll have a better financial outcome. So maybe the takeaway from that first segment was, if you if you sense that approach, run away. Yeah, good good advice. Um, and and just to add on to that, I, I've encountered I've encountered this, and I'm I'm making air quotes as I say this this kind of plan as proposal um, 
circumstance more times than I can imagine, unfortunately. And it's not just with investment advisors. I see it with insurance uh, agents as well, um, that they're ultimately there to show you why you need to buy a certain type and amount of insurance or an annuity or things like that. So as Mark said, um, yeah, be, be very, be very wary for someone that, um, that can't explain and uh, kind of demonstrate that they have an ongoing planning process. Um, I think and I would add good. one more thing as I, as I think about this, you know, we have been in a bull market since 2008 and it's been going on now for what, 13 years, something like that. Yep. Uh, about as long as any bull market has ever run. And, um, you know, it's really, really important to think about when it's really, really easy to be in business. You know, how much real work do you do other than simply riding the wave? In other words, to me, you know, 2 million plans with 1.1 average goals really tells me that we have a bunch of people in our profession that are just riding the wave. They're delivering a minimum amount of service because they only have to deliver a minimum amount of service. doesn't matter what your problem is. The market's going to bail you out. Hey, you're up another 20, whatever percent last year, right? It's really, really easy to look good when times are going really, really well. And I'm, I'm concerned, frankly, that we have an industry that's not well prepared to help clients deal with financial adversity when it rears its ugly head as it inevitably will. Yeah. And, and inevitable is the, the, the right word and the, and the word to take away from that, from that comment. Um, I, I think that, you know, uh, as, as good of thing, as good as things have been, and as long as they've been really, really good, um, almost inexplicably. So um, it, it's not going to be that way forever. And uh, I couldn't agree with more with what Mark said that, you know, are, are you um, uh, as a individual or a family um, and is your advisor um, or, or is he or she prepared for when things aren't going so, so well? And do they have a, do they have a process or a structure or framework in place with which to, to deal with that in a, in a measured, calm, uh, collected fashion? And have they been through times like that in the past? Those are all probably good questions you should ask if you're, you know, ever evaluating or interviewing advisors. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned that, Mark. Yeah, I mean, what did your business go through in 1999 to 2002? Oh, you weren't in business then. Well, all right. How about what did your business go through between 2006 and 2009? Oh, you weren't in business then either. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, all good questions. Um, and as, at the end of the day, as I always tell folks, um, and I would certainly emphasize this to our listeners, is um, despite good folks like Mark and others out there, and there are many, many really great advisors out there, you, you've got you've to be wary and, and keep your guard up because um, there are a lot of people that call themselves advisors that can talk a good game, but they're really just glorified salespeople, and um, there's no telling what they're going to sell you. So um, just, just be wary. Um, Mark, thank you again, by the way, for sharing all that. I, I think it's super helpful. And that's why I was really excited to have you join us today. Um, but as you know, uh, this is Women's Retirement Radio. And so everything that we do and talk about here uh, comes back to retirement, uh, especially as it relates to women and their families. So I'm curious when you, when you think of the retirement, uh, the word retirement for yourself, um, what comes to mind for you personally? For me personally, it was it was boredom. <laughs> That's why I started doing consulting work. Um, granted, this is not a typical time. Uh, we are, in fact, living through one of life's big surprises with this pandemic. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what retirement would look like just because I chose a particularly, you know, crappy time to retire. Do you think that, uh, can you envision there ever being a time in the future um, where you do maybe retire in the more traditional sense where you're, where you're not really doing anything from a, uh, I don't want to generalize too much by calling it work, but um, 
where, where you're not doing something where you're involved in this industry or another industry in some capacity? Can you, can you imagine where you're, or boredom won't be a challenge and, and you'll just kind of, you know, be quote unquote retired? Um, I don't know. It's a really good question. It's one of those things where, um, you know, maybe I'll know it when it happens, um, but it hasn't happened yet. So I, I can't really speculate. Yeah. What, um, and I'm curious, both from your experience as an advisor, um, as well as your role in talking with training and coaching other advisors, what do you think is the biggest challenge that women face as they plan for their own retirement? I think the biggest challenge is finding somebody that will talk to them in a way that they can understand. And I don't mean that disparagingly. This is true for men and women. It's just that the pre predominantly our advisor base are men. And you have all the challenges of any advisor talking to any client that can be a little bit more complicated if that person doing the advising is not, number one, a truly empathetic listener, and number two, willing to invest the time to truly communicate with clients. You know, the, the expert knowledge model of you don't need to, you don't need to understand it, just do it because I tell you to do it, is okay for a doctor. You know, if I have a, I had a broken leg once, I went in, the doctor showed me a whole bunch of images, didn't make a lick of sense to me, but fortunately they did to him. And uh, even better, he was able to then put the images away and talk to me about my injury and the treatment and our, our path to, to deal with it going forward in a way that I could actually understand. And I found that extraordinarily helpful. Our, our industry is very, very big at sending reams and reams of paper, whether it's performance reports or financial plan outputs that for most clients, men and women alike, mean about as much to them as, you know, my doctor sending me an MRI of my leg would have meant to me, which is to say nothing at all. So find somebody who actually will listen and talk to you in a way that you understand that deals with those issues of clarity and confidence in the manner that I described and that you're comfortable is going to be around when life's uncertainties finally manifest themselves, if that answers your question. No, it does. Uh, uh, wonderfully so. Thank you for that. And, and kind of as a maybe part two to that question, um, in your work, both as an advisor you know, years ago and more recently working with other advisors and, and even working with um, you know, the firms that you do today, how would you say that your your work and the work of the advisors and firms you work with, um, how does that impact women and their families as they're planning for and transitioning into retirement? So now, now it's not the biggest challenge. It's, it's now more of a like practical application. Like how, how do you think that um, your work um, both directly and indirectly um, has a positive impact on women as they are preparing for retirement? Well, I mean, my job is to train advisors to, to in fact, give empathetic listening a try and training them with techniques to help them to help clients talk freely about what purpose money serves in their lives, what their fundamental values are as it relates to money, right? What does money buy that you truly value? And then beyond that, how do those values translate into actionable financial goals? Right. So if I value spending time with my grandkids and I do, and to the extent that I need to have the money to go see them, right, then I need to have a goal for travel. Right. And, and that goal didn't come out of nowhere. It came to, it came out of the things that that are important to me. So, you know, helping an advisor to ask the right questions to understand not just what age and at what, in, what income do you want to retire, but what do you want your life to look like today, tomorrow, and in the future? And then having the proper tools to 
help them understand the reasonableness of their game plan, whether it's on track to, to be successful or not successful. If it's on track to be successful, right? What are the potential pitfalls that might take us off track and let's be mindful of those. And if it's not on track to be successful, what's the right change to make based on what you value, not based on what I value? Because unlike breaking your leg when there's you know a relatively narrow range of treatment options, um, when it comes to your financial life, if you have a shortfall, you could work longer, you could save more today, spend less tomorrow, change your estate goal, change your allocation in your portfolio, none of which is any better than any other, right? They're all equal in their ability to remedy a shortfall, but they feel different to the person making the change. And based on what they value, some of them are going to have a bigger impact than most, uh, than others rather. So uh, help to, to me, it's helping advisors to have those kinds of values-based conversations, to have the tools to help illustrate uncertainty, to give clients a level of clarity how those uncertainties are likely to affect them, and some level of confidence that they have the tools to make the changes they need to make at an acceptable level as life surprises come along. That, that's, to me, what I would want to help a good advisor to be able to do a better job of. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Hearing hearing you describe it in those terms, Mark, I'm I'm almost the the image that came to mind for me um, is is almost that of a guide. So less of an advisor like dispensing advice and more of a guide like kind of walking alongside someone and saying, like, hey, here's a detour. We need to make a choice. Um, let's talk about our choices and the pros and cons of each. Um, there's it's just, you know, something that kind of resonated me. Listen yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't matter whether we take the high road or the low road, you're going to have to walk it. Yeah. So I want to make sure it's a path that, that you're going to enjoy taking. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. As we as we wrap up uh, the conversation today, Mark, I always like to ask this question. Um, clearly, uh, you know, quote unquote, retirement did not suit you um, as you, I think, used the word boredom earlier to describe that experience. Um and so you're you've got you know some commitments and responsibilities um, you know with with work and your consulting clients. I know you're also a, a family man, and you've um, and I know that's important to you. But how do you most enjoy spending your time when you when you have an hour or two all to yourself? It depends on what I'm in the mood for. Uh, if I'm in the mood to do something outdoors, I'll hop on my bike. And, you know, I, I'm very fortunate. There's a bunch of bike paths that that are right in across the street from my house. Uh, if I'm feeling a little creative, maybe I'll go up and, and bang on my guitars and see what happens there. Um, I'm a readaholic, uh, so it's always there's always going to be something I'm going to want to read, most typically fiction. Um, if I want uh, to do a deep dive on something, I may, I may uh, you know, open up my computer and, you know, do some research on a topic of interest. Um, it so it just depends really on the mood. What's a, what's a book you've read recently that you really, really enjoyed? Something that we might uh, recommend to our listeners? Well, I am a, I am a speculative fiction fan. Um, and so uh, before I go see the movie with my son uh, um, at an IMAX, uh, I read reread the novel Dune by Frank Herbert, one of my all-time favorite science fiction classics. Yeah, yeah, I know that one's. Uh, I know that one's coming out here soon. I'll be curious to see if the uh, if the this version does the the book justice. That is, that's yeah, that's a great book. I've read it too. I I like uh, I like sci fi uh, as well. So um, great recommendation. We'll we'll be sure to share that uh, in the show notes. Um, wrapping up, Mark. We've covered a lot. This has been fun. I'm I'm thankful for the time and you, your willingness to join us and, and share some of your expertise and experience today. If there were one thing our listeners could take away from our conversation, uh, what would you want that one thing to be? You know, if you have an existing relationship with an advisor, just look back and ask yourself, what's changed, right? In other words, the world is constantly changing and, and, 
in many cases, not for the better, you know, has my advisor shown a willingness to change their business to account for everything else that we see around us. And I don't just mean switching to Zoom calls, you know, during lockdown. I mean, you know, are they fundamentally growing their expertise in a way that as a client means something to me? Are there visible changes in how they are running their business um, that I can see that have a meaningful impact positively, obviously, uh, for me as a client? Um, but if I have somebody that's just, you know, mailing it in, uh, maybe it's time to, to look around. If you don't have an advisor and you're considering some important financial decisions, interview a few advisors. Um, there's never going to be um, a time when do it yourself um, is going to be the right way to go. Um, I think people, given the wealth of information out there, confuse access to information with acquisition of expertise, and, and they are sadly not the same. Um, don't, don't wait to try to fix a mistake in your personal financial life. Uh, work with somebody that can help you to either not make a mistake or to minimize uh, any, any uh, bad outcomes. Um, and if you're not sure, talk to somebody. I, uh, I think that's a, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. So uh, I appreciate, I appreciate that Mark and um, always enjoy speaking with you today was certainly no exception. Um, if, if someone out there is listening, um, maybe a consumer, maybe an advisor, and they're, they're intrigued with some of your perspectives and what you shared and, and they want to reach out, maybe just to say, hello, what's the, what's the best way for people to, to reach out or get in touch, or maybe just keep an eye on what you're working on. Well, if you're in the profession, uh, I do check my LinkedIn page now and then. Um, if you're an individual, um, I, I haven't had an individual practice in the last 15 years, so that's probably not going to be helpful. Um, so what was what else did you ask? I was just wanting to know if people did want to reach out or wanted to know how they could follow you or keep up with what you're working on, what would be the best way to do it? It sounds like it might be LinkedIn and any, any, any other resources you'd point them to. Yeah, I'd say LinkedIn. I mean, bottom line is my, my, my footprint right now is pr pretty stealthy. Um, you know, I'm working with enterprise owners trying to help build new tools to help advisors be more effective in doing all the things that we covered on our call today. So hopefully um, some work that I had some input in developing uh, gets out into the marketplace uh, in, in the next six to 12 months in a way that can, can hopefully help somebody, either awesome. a client or an advisor. Yeah, well, I, uh, we'll, we'll be sure to share a link to your, um, to your LinkedIn profile and, and a link to your, uh, to your book recommendation of Dune for those that might be interested in checking that out ahead of the, uh, ahead of the uh, forthcoming movie release. But um, all I can say is uh, thanks, Mark. This has been great. Uh, always enjoy speaking with you. This was a, a fun conversation and I know that it will be helpful and valuable to, to many of our listeners. So thank you. My pleasure. Us. And uh, thank you uh, to each of you out there listening. Um, always appreciate your uh, sticking around and, uh, and listening in on our conversations with interesting guests like Mark. Um, again, this is Russ Thornton. Um, this has been another episode of Women's Retirement Radio, and we look forward to catching up with you again next time. It's Russ again. And before you go, I want to provide a brief disclosure. You should consult a financial advisor familiar with the specific circumstances of your unique financial situation before making any financial decisions. Nothing in this broadcast constitutes a solicitation for the sale or purchase of any securities. Any mentioned rates of return are historical or hypothetical in nature and are not a guarantee of future returns. I'm a financial advisor and an investment advisor representative of Wealthcare Capital Management, LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor based in Richmond, Virginia. The views discussed in this podcast are my own and may not be consistent with or represent those of Wealthcare Capital Management.